so we're going to talk to, to get, uh, today about multinational and multilingual websites. So I know that it's quite easy from your point of view doing multilingual in Drupal, especially after the session this morning with Gabor. Um, actually, it's quite different if you want to do multinational websites when you have several countries and uh, it starts to be really complicated if you introduce e-commerce inside these multinational multilingual systems. So today we are free on stage. Um, you have Scott, uh, guys from Commerce Guys, uh, who is a Drupal developer, so he's hands on the things. We have um, Arthur from Adex. Um, he's a senior Drupal architect, and he worked on one of the platforms we've talking today. And my name is Maxim. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Adex. So if we go back like one year and a half ago, the, there was a client, a big international group, and maybe you know it, LVMH, probably not, but you, I'm sure you know their products. LVMH is Louis Vuitton, Mouet Chandon, Dior, Guerlain, Makeup Forever, Celine, many, many, it's, it's the number one luxury group in the world. And they asked us for, uh, for a website doing e-commerce. So the objective was actually quite simple. So they wanted an e-commerce platform connected with SAP, which is an ERP system, with a lot of rich editorial content, like, um, you know, in every luxury website you have big pictures, nice sliders, everything is moving. And they wanted to manage multiple countries. They are present in almost all countries in the world. I would say rich countries, Dubai, China, well. Huh? And, of course, we have to manage several languages, and uh, each count is quite independent because you can sell not the same kind of products in Japan and in France and UK. And, but in the same time, the content, because it's all centralized, luxury, you know, brand experience is so important, everything has to be um, controlled and validated by friends, uh, except some content, which is totally independent and created like actualities and news uh, local. And, of course, it has to be fluid front-end, and it should work in EU6 because we have China. Uh, so we said, okay, no problem, let's do it. Um, <laughs> why? And then the guys said, why did you accept that? Uh, some, some numbers about the website we're talking about. It's a platform, so there are several websites with several brands, but it's all the same. We have two main ERPs, uh, which is SAP and GD Edwards. Uh, we have about 16 countries, including China. We have 18 languages to manage. Well, some countries have several languages, some others have only one. And we have about, per website, we have about 2,000 and a half uh, product references. Uh, so the project itself, if we talk about projects, it's about 15,000 man hours. Uh, 12 months of development, more or less. So we don't do the design. Design was provided by an agency, and it involved about 15 people on our side. And uh, yeah, we have about 70. I don't know. I know that it's not really relevant, but it plays you think like 70 templates, 57 content types. Um, so when we arrived this, uh, to the tender with RFP stuff, we proposed very, something very simple, Drupal, um, Drupal Commerce, of course, and um, feeds to include, to implement um, SAP integration and solar for search. Some strategic uh, choices were, the first one was single Drupal instance for all the websites. All of our competition, um, Capgemini, Publicis, they suggest to, to, to make as many instances as we have countries. And we said that it, it, it's useless. Why, why doing that? It will be very painful to support. So we suggested to put all the, all the countries, all the traffic, everything in one single website, actually one single uh, Drupal instance, because it will be much easier for translation, much easier for content sharing, everything. And uh, we know that the site's launch will be progressive, one country by one country. That's important because that means that some of the websites, because they already have websites, will be, um, will be on the old technology, out of Drupal, and the new ones will be uh, on Drupal, all in the same. So there are several, like, redirects, CDN stuff. And they absolutely wanted import and export of the content using Excel, not CSV, Excel. So it's quite complicated because, of course, it's a closed format. There are some li libraries in PHP that offer you this functionality, but it doesn't work very well. So this was else important. 
And of course, some of the websites are e-commerce, so you can buy. Some of them are not. You can see the price and add, add the wish list, or some of them doesn't show even the price. So, well, we have to add these kind of things. And of course, no flash, and we have this luxury uh, HTML5 animation all, the, all around. So, this is basically a very classical uh, architecture. We have Drupal in the middle, exchanging SKUs, which is product references, stocks, orders, and clients. And I see it's written in French, that's cool. Command is orders. Um, we have Experian for, um, for um, validating the addresses, like my, my address. It's, everything is validated to QA, so we are sure that we send this beautiful package for 200 pounds to the right person. And we have Fianet for uh, 3D secure and payment gateways. And uh, we have contributors which upload media files and Excels. Um, the first thing we had to manage is, was countries and languages. So as you can imagine, um, the first thing we was, we, the idea was like, we have French language. So we translate everything in French and then we simply activate the language in the right country. In Switzerland they speak French, we activate it. In Canada they speak French, we activate the French language. It's, it was simply very, it was crystal clear that doesn't work at all because actually there is a lot of differences between different French languages or Spanish languages. They don't speak the same Spanish in Mexico than in Spain and they don't speak absolutely not the same French in Canada and France. So we created like many fake languages like there is France French, there is a France Switzerland, uh, but doing that you can imagine this is a number of countries and languages it was, uh, it was really complicated because they asked, like, we have to translate five times the same, the same content and the same um, interface strings, and we have to enable some capabilities to copy and paste the entire uh, set of languages. Like, you, you, all, all, you have your 1,000 products in French, you, you should be able to copy and paste this in French for Canada. Um, Maybe, Arthur, could you explain a little bit yes. more about languages and how it works? So the management of languages uh, was based on uh, uh, standard Drupal modules like localization client, which provides a small, nice block in the bottom of the page, which uh, displays all the strings uh, used uh, on the page. Uh, translation template extractor, because all the translation is done by agencies. Uh, so it's, uh, and the process is industrialized, so you have to export file, then they send it to like 30 people, and uh, in one day they get a uh, fully translated uh, interface. And uh, entity translation. Well, this is interesting part, uh, entity translation, because uh, in Drupal 7 default translation uh, module, uh, it copies nodes. There are many, if we have five languages, it means that we have five different uh, nodes. Uh, logically, it's the same content, but for some reason, we have five different uh, nodes. So entity translation fixes this. Uh, uh, instead, you have uh, one node with the per field translation. And this is useful because some fields should be translated, some not. For example, images can be shared, uh, product images can be shared across uh, translations. And this feature it will be built in in Drupal 8. Uh, it was described by Gabor, Gabor uh, today. Um, Pretty much uh, standard workflow for translating interface, uh, with one exception, we wanted to export strings. For example, we need to export PO file uh, for French, for Chinese, um, and uh, we wanted to export only those strings which were already translated in French, not to, because we have uh, like thousands of different strings uh, all over in a Drupal interface, but we don't want to translate all of them. We want just to translate those that are visible to users. So this we had to build um, ourselves. Um, each country, so it's a multi-country website, and every country can be accessed uh, with the, in two ways, uh, via dedicated domain uh, or by uh, standard domain slash country code. So this, uh, the choice, it belongs to countries. They decide uh, which way do they want to use. But um, yes, we use domain access module, uh, which offers this feature uh, pretty much uh, out of the box. Um, 
There were, however, a few features which we had to build uh, to support the requirements of our clients. So when we create a new country, uh, well, in technical terms, this is new domain, um, usually the, new, uh, the content of the new website with this new domain, it's empty, there is nothing. So there are no translations, there is nothing. In our case, it was very important that we uh, copy all the structure of the content from another language. So if, for, for example, we have a central website with the, another domain which is French, and we're creating Chinese website, and uh, during the creation of this domain, we say, okay, we want to copy all the content from uh, English website. It means that when we uh, finalize this uh, creation process of Chinese website, they have everything. They have home page, products, menus, categories, fully working website, and everything they have to do in the end is just to translate all that uh, content. Uh, so three features were essential for for the clients. Uh, uh, big companies like uh, Make Up Forever, Guilan, and uh, so on, um, they're multi-country, but anyway, there, are, uh, there is a headquarter somewhere. So for example, there is headquarters in London, and uh, these headquarters, they want to be in control of all the content of all the departments in other countries. They don't want to uh, country departments to create some, uh, I don't know, best content. So they make sure that everything is nice and clean in all the countries. So um, to do that, we created a central repository. We call it central country. Um, and uh, for example, if new project, a new product is created by Guerlain, uh, it's created in central repository and then copied to France and translated to French. Uh, the second uh, feature is the possibility to copy all the content from one language to another. Uh, so for example, we create, uh, uh, we have France with French language, uh, we create Belgium with the Belgium French because there are some small differences and uh, they want to leverage all the translation done by uh, France, so everything they have to do is just to copy all the content from France to Belgium. Um, and the third feature was very important as well. As we have uh, the central repository which can be updated by headquarters, uh, the countries, uh, they need to get notifications uh, about these updates. So for example, let's say we have a product A in central repository in English, and then we have a translation of this product A in France, uh, in French, of course. When this product A is updated in the central repository, uh, people in France, they see a small, like a small notification in the back office on the dashboard with their products, saying that, okay, this product was updated in the central repository. And then they can just contact the editors of uh, headquarters and check uh, which changes were made and uh, so on. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, the one thing we we've also was like challenged by the client was uh, the workflow. Because imagine you have several countries, everybody's publishing, editing content. The workflow was, seems to be very important. Actually, after going back and forward, we, we, we finished to cancel the work on the workflow. We stopped to work. Uh, well, it was too, co too complicated for the client. I mean, we built the thing, but it was too complicated. So the, for the primary contents, like editor uh, content and products, there is no workflow. There are only two versions, like draft and published. So we are switching between revisions. And there, there is only the real workflow for home pages, because home page editing is very important. It has to be validated by several people. So there is a very standard classical uh, uh, workflow. Uh, you can we'll download this slides later if you want to see the, all these small arrows. Um, the, the, the very interesting thing is the translation workflow. Um, because when we, when, what, what happens what, what, when we say that content translation gets really published? So we have several uh, conditions. The original language and the central content have to be available uh, for, for the country. So the, 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 the initial package in the central have to be available. Um, and uh, once the, everything is translated, then only they can really get published to the website. So the, the published con condition have that we have, for example, for a product, all the fields are translated and available. So this is kind of custom too because we use entity translation and we have to support this kind of when it's really published because, well, 
it's, it's, it's necessary. Uh, there is another problem which we was facing is each country have a different rules and uh, condition for addresses and forms. For example, in, in the France you have to just opt in uh, and you cannot automatically opt in. Uh, in other countries you can push the checkbox automatically to automatically opt in. In other countries the, the, um, the address structure is not the same. In China, in Japan, for example, it's very different from France. In France we have six fields, in Japan only two, in, in the US is other kind of fields. So all the sign up, for example, it's very simple basic stuff like sign up uh, have to be uh, adapted for each country. So there is a kind of big uh, <laughs> big interface configuration where for each country we can say I want this field is mandatory, it's visible or not. So we can also add conditions. So this per country. So this simple sign up is different for each country. This was kind of complicated. So this is something that that's we learned really when it was the tender period in RFP, we was like, oh, we'll build you the most complex workflow ever. Like everything will be validated going through different paths and everything will, will work perfectly. And then we build it. We spend like three sprints only doing this workflow. And when, once we finish and we show to the client this workflow, they said, I don't want that. But, but you said you wanted that. No, remove it, please. Okay, no problem, we, we, we throw it away. So actually, it's very often that the clients ask for something that he doesn't really want to. And you have to be very careful with that because you will spend a lot of time building complex things that maybe they don't really need, even if they ask for. So this is something that we learned with this project. So just, are you sure you want that? Like, make sure that this is what he, they really want. Um, this is another um, thing that we learned. Uh, entity translation was, is, 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 is a very nice idea. It works perfectly, probably in Drupal 8. But in Drupal 7, it was um, not the mainstream. Um, and we spent a lot of time to support, to, to debug, and, and we corrected several issues, and we got many <coughs> problems with the client understanding the concept of entity translation. So I think that going not the mainstream is not a good idea. After all, if we did it in Drupal 8, it would be a good idea using entity translation. But in Drupal 7, I would go for uh, classical standard nodes thing. Well, it's, it was uh, something complicated. Well, then we have, we have this multi-currencies problem. We have a lot of problems. So uh, I will let uh, Scott explain it a bit more, because I don't know anything about multiple country. Uh, hopefully I do, um, but you can judge at the end. Um, if I don't cover a lot of detail in this sort of brief few slides, there's a Commerce Module Tuesday um, video on DrupalCommerce.org, um, which covers it in more detail. So I'm only going to briefly explain multi-currency. I can't comment on how they've implemented it, but they're using the Commerce Multi-Currency Module, so presumably it's, it's the same uh, implementation. Um, so firstly, it's good to explain how Commerce actually stores its prices. We store them in a price field, which means we can show them on a product and reference them on a line item, and you see them on the order. Um, the magic price field uh, stores three key pieces of information. Uh, the amount, its currency code, and then some metadata, which lets you do nice things around pricing. So if you want uh, date-specific pricing, you can store sort of nice metadata in, in the uh, serialized array. Uh, in the commerce multi-currency module, there's two approaches. Um, one lets you sort of manage less data so you can have your price field uh, in all of your different currencies and just have an exchange rate um, reference from either an exchange rate mechanism or a custom exchange rate mechanism, meaning you only have to enter one price and the rules engine will dynamically uh, convert your prices for your products. Um, if you want more granular control over your products, there's a, uh, the other alternative, which uh, is here. Um, it lets you enable a price field per currency. So if I'm viewing my product uh, and editing my product, I can see a field for Swiss franc, euro, US dollars, and I can turn them on and off um, depending on, on what currencies I'm using. One of the interesting use cases we've had on a recent project is not all the time do you want to actually have that country's currency 
uh, enabled. So for a client of ours, Vivian Westwood, they uh, sell to Canada, but they sell to Canada in US dollars at a different exchange rate to what the US dollar actually is. So they, they mark up um, their currency in Canada. So we can enable US dollars, which is fine for when they uh, want to sell stuff to the US, but they needed a US dollars too. So with this multi-currency format in the commerce multi-currency module, you can create uh, sort of the fake currencies and have them reference the same currency, which is, which is quite a handy use case. What I talked about with the dynamic currency conversion. Uh, so here you can set an exchange rate and um, the rules engine will convert it for you. Um, so basically it's all about rules. Once you've set up your currencies, you can have your rules convert the currency to the, to the right one depending on what location the user's in or any, any, any format you want really. Um, so if, you, if those currency fields don't offer you enough control, you can override it in rules, which is, which is nice. <clears throat> yeah. One of, the, one of the last things we, we had to, to implement when, when during these multiple counties is geolocalization. So guys arriving on your website, what are the rules that why they arrive to the Japanese website or to the French website? So it seems again very simple. You go max mind, you redirect the user, that's all. Um, well, it, it's actually not that easy because again you have several levels of, of uh, um, of applications working on, on top of your website, on Drupal website. You have the CDN, you have this uh, uh, dispatcher web page, which is at the beginning not in Drupal, because you have all the websites, old websites, which are not in Drupal, and you have this new MaxMind thing to implement. And then you have varnish, everything, so you have to take care about many things. So actually the workflow for just to geolocate locate the user is, is not that easy. You have these cookies, you have to geolocate the user using MaxMind. Uh, you get some errors because MaxMind it's like 85 percent hits um, and, and you have to check if the country exists. If not, you send to the international. You update, well, it's, you have to think about it. It's, it's not that easy. It's not complicated, but you have to, to think about, um, well, a lot of text on that, but uh, the, the main idea of that is like uh, we have to support the case if the country is not found. We have to support the case when we do not want to geolocalize users so we can force the system not to uh, redirect it. And we have to send him to the right country based on the IP or browser capabilities, so with some fallbacks, well, all this stuff. Um, the last thing is, is this important export of the content. That's really important. Nobody will use, there is about 50 fields in each product, describing the product. So nobody will use the back office of Drupal. Even if it's very nice, the, the, the management of the product line is always done in some Excel, SAP, whatever. Usually the marketing department, they don't use SAP because it's really ugly. And, and it's slow and it's, it's so you usually what you store in SAP is title, SKU and prices, that's all. All the marketing data like images, pictures, videos, uh, description, ingredients, whatever, everything goes somewhere. Somewhere is usually Excel because marketing guys, and I know some marketing guys here, they, <laughs> I see one, uh, they don't like using back office interfaces, so they will use Excel, and you have to support Excel. And don't tell them, uh, it's like, see, use CSV. It's, it's not CSV because if you manage multiple countries, multiple languages, CSV will simply not work all the time. You will get a lot of errors. So we tried a lot of formats to, to support XLS in the best way. Finally, we found out that the XL97 <laughs> binary format by BIFF8, it's the one that works the best. I would say the less uh, worst solution. Um, and we use feeds to import the data, split the XLS file in s small parts, because if you import the 2,500 SKU and with 50 fields, you will crash your system during the import because you will use too much memory and you, so you have to split the file in small part, put it in a queue and then manage with feeds importing small pieces of this queue to avoid crashing your, your system. Um, so you have of course some kind of um, 
uh, very simple back office dashboards to support this. And you have two files, actually, the catalog, like categories, subcategories, things, and you have another file for the SKUs. Uh, and you also have to support the big zip archive for media, because you have a lot of images. For each product, we have five to ten images, so you have to, 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 to upload the, those two. And for example, product images, we have the primary image list, we have several zoomed image, we have a background because when you present a lipstick, you want something red in the background. When you present a perfume, you want something white. So you have this background image, and of course it's all responsive, so you have different formats. And for each um, SK, you have the primary list, background, but also texture. That's something very interesting because uh, when you have, for example, um, some cosmetics, uh, you have thousands of colors, and they, don't, they cannot not afford shooting each color. So to avoid shooting each color, what we've actually uh, find out, we upload the texture, black and white, like bump mapping texture, and then we apply the exact color on it, like a mask. So in this way, we avoid them to shooting all the, all the pictures of all the variants. So we generate kind of colors. It's, it's quite accurate, it, and you have the impression of, because of the texture, you have the impression of, of real shooting. Um, and then, yeah, all 40 fields. Then the, the, the catalog structure is, uh, is quite complex. You have family, group, category, and they are not like, you can, you, ha you can have some categories inside the family. You can, well, it's quite complex. So that's why we separate it in two files. One for the catalog and association with products, and one for the ESCOs. Uh, then SAP. It's, the integration of SAP is, is not so complicated. It's quite, ob it's quite simple, actually. It's just painful, because you have this big um, SAP sends you uh, the catalog, SKUs, stocks, and, and order statuses, and you send them orders and clients. So working with SAP is not so complicated, but you have this 5,000 XML for, uh, for each order, so you just have to debug that. This is something complicated because you have 5,000 lines and if you have one single error, you get an answer like, not okay, and you have to find out why. Um, so there is a couple of things that really works very well and I really suggest you to do it if you have to implement some external systems. And um, the problem is like SAP is a big piece of software. Um, yeah. And the problem is that usually then you work with SAP guys, they say, ah, you do Drupal, like, uh, yeah, it's your problem if it doesn't work. You don't know how to send SOAP requests. So to prove then that I was right and, and, and SAP is wrong, you have to, 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 you don't have access to logs SAP. And if you require for, for the hosting company, just send me the logs, you, it will take like three days. So to avoid that, we created a simple tool to send XML directed to SAP in the back office of Drupal. So this avoids like debugging and waiting two days and then get back the answer. You can go, log into the back office, copy paste some XML and send to SAP on different uh, web services. So you can debug very easily in the real environment because of course in production you don't have access to nothing. Uh, and of course it's very important to put a log for every single piece of content you send on UC from SAP because each time they said it's your fault all the time. So to avoid any discussions you log everything. Of course not in production but in, 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 um, in development stages, you log absolutely everything. So when they say, it's, there's, it's your problem, you just send the log and say, no, it's yours. Uh, this is just an example of, of the back office. Very simple. You select the endpoint, and then you copy-paste your XML. That's all. And you send. It's very easy to test. And then this is an example of the, of the log everything. So I can download the request and say, no, it's not my fault. Um, there was another thing is that uh, at the end of the project we, we almost finished everything, solved all the bugs with SAP, with upload of the content, everything was fine. And, 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 and one girl from the client said, hey guys, I don't know why there is no little um, lock in the, in the bottom of my, of my browser. Usually when I go uh, shopping on Amazon there is, a, there is a little lock and we say, oh my god, we forgot SSL. And it was like months before the release, of course, with all this um, 
um, different, different validations we need. So it was like panic mode, and we spend a lot, lot of time to, to implement SSL. It's not that easy again, because you think like, oh, we, okay, we, no problem. We upload an SSL certificate on the web server, and it will work. Oh, no, because the problem that you have CDN, you have uh, Varnish, you have Nginx, you have Drupal. So the problem was, and you have the existing website who already implements um, uh, secure pages. So we created a subdomain like secure.bialan.com, which actually covers um, all the pages that are related to secure, like uh, login, logout, um, sign up, uh, order, checkout, etc. Um, and then we have to install this certificate. Uh, and the problem was the secure.gala.com was already used by existing websites. So I was not, we, we, we cannot just put the certificate. So we created WWS, another subdomain. We uploaded the certificate there. And with, if you add the varnish and, uh, and cookies and CDN and secure cookies, you spend a lot of time. Everything could be easily solved if we was thinking about at the beginning of the project, but at the end, everybody is in panic mode. You make many errors. So take care about SSL. It's not, again, that easy that you think about. Um, yeah, this is something that, well, this is what I was just saying, that, that, that really be careful and implement the SSL at the very beginning because it will avoid you a lot of errors and debugging at the end. Um, finally, we have this smooth front end. Nothing much to say about that. It's just fluid. With a, we, we, there will be a mobile version later. So, well, that's, that's all about matters about HTML. Nothing, nothing more to say about. Uh, but there is something to say about the optimization because, of course, Drupal, the site is built all with panels, views, uh, all the standard stuff, and, if, of course, it's very, very slow. So we got some ideas. So the website is huge, there is lots of content, uh, many countries, many users, many languages, and uh, what we don't want to happen is that uh, day after the release, uh, the client will call us and say, well, uh, the website, we cannot open the page. So to do that, uh, we uh, wanted to make sure that we use all of the tools available in the market just to be sure that the website is quite fast and uh, available in all the countries. So on the top of everything, there is a CDN, uh, which is serving uh, static content, uh, like images, um, JavaScript, CSS. Uh, there is a microcache and CDN for HTML as well, like for a couple of seconds. Um, we've got uh, five different domains, uh, which are called staticgirland.com. Uh, it's static1, static2, static3, just to parallelize the download of static content uh, in the browser. Um, uh, then we use Varnish, Nginx, Drupal, Memcache, Entity Cache, Views Cache, ESI, Blocks uh, with JavaScript. But uh, all that is not very interesting. The interesting part is uh, cache for authenticated users because the website is uh, e-commerce. So of course there will be most of the users will be uh, authenticated. Uh, how do we keep more or less the same uh, page load speed for authenticated users as for anonymous? We cannot just simply cache all the pages for all authenticated users because even if there is some small parts of dynamic content, still there are different roles. For, for example, there is a group of users uh, which are called uh, industry uh, or professionals and they have a 40% discount on the website. So the prices of products will be a bit different. And uh, there are some uh, products which uh, are available only to pro uh, user accounts. So to do this, we did a very tricky VCL uh, configuration file for Varnish, and uh, we have two different storage uh, storages in Varnish for uh, different caches, uh, depending on the role uh, of the user. Uh, the very important, um, the very important lesson uh, which we've got from our experience is that you have to think about performance in the beginning of the project. So day one of the project you already are thinking about performance. Because in the end of the project, well, you never have free time uh, in the end of the project. That never happens. And uh, you just simply won't have enough time, uh, like two or three weeks in the end, to work on performance optimizations. Uh, so in the first sprint, activate everything you can. 
if you know that you will use varnish, install varnish on development websites, enable memcached, uh, entity cache, uh, all the aggregation stuff, enable all that on your staging server, on your pre-production server, so that when you go to production, uh, at least your infrastructure is the same uh, on your development server uh, as is on your production. Um, yeah. I will let uh, Maxim <laughs> to continue. This yeah, the, well, the idea at the end of all this, another thing we learned is like, if you do everything Drupal way, like everybody's here doing on the Drupal way, never, never, ever some SQL queries and theming, well, perfect. But even this is not enough. I mean, at some stage, you face some Drupal internals problem, like, for example, we discovered that cache form table grows, and we get like 10 gigabytes of, of, of this table, so it's never clean. So we have to, um, we have to add some, some, some code to clean it up. Um, actually, you think that cache form is, is, is a cache storage, but it's, it's used in another way. Um, for example, we got these Drupal commerce logs tables uh, while committing updates. We have, we, well, you always, you always discover small stuff. So even if you do uh, this perfectly Drupal way, you have to always keep an eye on logs, on what happens on your server, what happens on your MySQL. Uh, so you, you, you have to check it out and, of course, g g give back everything that you found to the community. It's really important to spend time on log and tuning because you have to add on your project like some time for this. Um, one of the reasons we've... Uh, we actually selected uh, a Drupal, but we, we didn't select a Drupal, actually we do only Drupal, so we, we, we didn't really select it, but the client actually accepted using Drupal, is to be able to create a platform. This is kind of site factory, Acquia launches site factory, everybody wants a site factory, just copy paste sites and don't pay these crazy agencies and Drupal shop for so much money. So I just want copy paste my sites. So, well, it's it's, it's, it might work in some cases. The good example is probably Acquia Warner. They like for uh, Justin Bieber and for, uh, I don't know, um, Britney Spears, the, kind of the same websites, very simple. You can copy paste. Johnson & Johnson is a good example too. We can copy paste websites and redo only the front end. For big platforms, it's, <laughs> well, it's utopia. You cannot just copy and paste websites. Uh, with thousands of content. What we reused actually, because we built Guerlain, we built then on the same platform, Makeup Forever, we reused the countries, languages, and multi-site system. It's the same. And we spent so much time. Import, export, workflow, which this is partial reuse, because as soon as you get a new client, a new brand, they say, I don't want that, I want to add this, I want to remove that, I don't need that field. Uh, the connectors to the SAP GDWs, those remains, and uh, well, this, as you share the same Drupal versions, same kind of things, and if you do it in the right way using features, you can kind of reuse things. But I would say that if you're facing like Site Factory RFP, be careful because, uh, well, usually it costs much more money than the, 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 the client thinks. To create a new site on the site factory, the platform thing, it doesn't save like twice the price of the project. So, well, just take care of it. It's not that easy. So, thank you, everybody. And if you have some questions, these slides, of course, will be on SlideShare. And if you didn't like, if you have some tomatoes, you can throw those guys, please. And if you have some questions, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh -huh. How did you guys work on, on this project? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, on this particular project, we... Yeah, yeah, the question was how we work together with commerce guys. Uh, thank you, Henry. Um, the question, well, it's a very good question. Usually what, how we work on this particular project, we, we, we did it not together. Like, the project was won without commerce guys, but it's, it's, it's not a big issue. Usually how we work with, uh, how we work with commerce guys, and, and, and they provide security to the client. Uh, it's the same like Acquia does. Um, they provide security. If you go with big, big, big company, like, I don't know, LVMH, Total, uh, 
uh, Exxon Mobile, what, or Exxon whatever, or big mobile groups. So then the problem is that you are a small Drupal shops. Okay, we have Capgemini. They don't need probably Acquia or, or commerce guys, but all the, all the guys like Wondercrowd, uh, I don't know, Icos, uh, all the guys like small Drupal shops, uh, the big companies are scared about giving projects to, to 100 guys, to 50, comp 50 guys' companies. And Acquia or commerce guys, they bring actually expertise, but they also bring insurance. Like, if you have any problems, if the company you work with, Ajax, fails, and tomorrow Ajax is no more here, which I don't think so, it will arrive one day, but who knows, they can always select the right partner and take care of your project. So it's kind of insurance, both from the technical point of view and, and, and from a more business point of view. Thank you. Any other question? Oh, sorry. Yes, and I, just, I would like to add about the, uh, so when, for example, we do e-commerce websites and there is some feature, e-commerce feature, which is not, uh, which doesn't exist yet uh, on the website, we're going to ask Drupal uh, commerce guys, of course, to develop this feature uh, for us. But, uh, uh, well, uh, unfortunately, all the features already, most of the features <laughs> of e-commerce already developed in the Drupal commerce, so. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, it's it's a good question. We have and they also can help you to like if you give them some feature to do, they can also take care of implementing this in the roadmap and make sure that the thing is on the website Drupal.org supported, implemented in Kickstart, implemented everything with the documentation stuff like that. That's also important for the big clients to make sure that the custom code you created for them is not the only. They will be not the only one who use it. So, so like a, a popular a popular example of that is uh, payment gateways. Um, pretty much every client I work with always wants a different payment gateway and our partners always come to us asking for can we have this particular payment gateway that no one's ever heard of. We first question why would you use that and not one that we've already built but if they're very persistent on y using that payment gateway we're, we generally are quite good at building them so that's one of the ways that yeah. we help out. So bitcoins for example is a good example. <laughs> if you want um, any questions? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm, they can translate. They can edit it, but they cannot push it. Just, I, I will precise because uh, on Gilan.com there is no such workflow, but it exists on MakeupForever.com. Uh, so you have a central website with the English language and the, like all the other uh, languages uh, uh, related to this central, uh, central one. So they get notifications from this central repository. But it's possible to make uh, some country a central repository, like a source of notifications for another country. So for example, Belgium wants to get notifications from France, not from uh, central repository which is in English. So it doesn't answer your question 100% uh, but uh, it's more or less the same. Like big markets, they can be central repositories for uh, smaller ones. Yes? Uh, you're talking about, uh, so the, the question was, if we did anything to improve the translation workflow for markets. Uh, if the question is about uh, interface translation, then yes, uh, we did. Uh, we, we tried, because we didn't want to, basically the markets asked us to send them the PO file, uh, which they will send to special companies that uh, do translation. But we didn't want to send them like all the strings in Drupal. We wanted to send them only those strings which, uh, which are actually visible on backend and uh, front end. So uh, what we did, uh, we, uh, de we developed an export which exports only those strings that were already translated in another language. So for the first website, for the first language, you have to work hard uh, with the Drupal translation interface, but then you can just export this difference, uh, what has been already translated in another language, and uh, simplifies uh, a lot the work of uh, uh, translation teams.
we didn't uh, we didn't our in our case uh, they understood the difference so uh, but uh, in Gerla, in, yeah the, the, the thing is that uh, for example Gerland, I know that they, the interface is exported in PO files but there's not so much interface and then the content itself you can upload it using the Excel file so when this export, you export in, in French, you send it to your translator, Excel, they know how to translate, and then you re-import the contents. So the big piece of content is, is in Excel file, and then you still have some interfaces, but not so much. I, I, I wouldn't say how much strings you have, it's, but it's, it's not so big. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a, it's a big problem. But to solve this problem, you have to, to spend too much time. Uh, you cannot, like everything, maybe in Drupal 8 they actually solved that in some kind of way, but, we, but in Drupal 7 at, at, you would spend like months to, to solve the problem, so it's not suitable for a client project. Yep. Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, as, well, in our case, we had a very custom revision system. So we had two different nodes. One was draft, another one was uh, published. So, and uh, the workflow, like the transition between draft uh, to published, um, uh, on Gerland, for example, there was, was no workflow at all. So the editors were responsible when they click on the uh, button publish in the draft uh, revision. Uh, they are responsible for the content which goes to publish. On makeupforever.com, we had a workflow with the different uh, validate, uh, two validate, uh, validated states. Uh, but this was uh, this was something custom. It wasn't. Uh, we didn't use uh, Workbench, but we do use Workbench on. Uh, more simple websites. We did use them. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. The, uh, for, for this client, uh, so the question was: uh, was we we was dealing with local companies or only with headquarters? So for this LVMH, we was dealing only with headquarters. Even worse, I would say we was dealing the IT, with the IT department and, 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 and various, very low communication with the end client. But for other clients, like, like some example from Johnson & Johnson, it's a good example, we deal a lot of these local brands. So it's, it's really dependent of, 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 of the client. But this, if the client is very centralized, like LVMH Group is very centralized, everything is decided centrally. Uh, for others, very decentralized, Organization, you usually will deal. You'll have to deal with with local local markets, and it's 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 another it's a lot of pain to. Well, yeah. That's all. No more questions. Thank you. Bye.